today's reading is taken from 1 Peter 2 verses 9 to 12. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Hello. Welcome to Avenue on YouTube. You join us in the middle of a series looking at the book of 1 Peter. Um, we're in chapter 2, starting at verse 9 today. Um, and we've been looking through this letter for the last couple of weeks. If you've not watched it yet, I recommend going back, having a look at some of the other videos. And I want to start now by asking a question that I think a lot of Christians, if not every Christian, wonders, even if they don't ask out loud at some point. And the question's this. If you've never thought this, I wonder how you'd answer it. The question is... Why doesn't God just take us straight up to heaven when we get saved? When we become a Christian, why aren't we just taken straight to heaven? Like, if we're saved to be with him, wouldn't it be better if he just took us straight away to go and be with him? If we are, as chapter 2 verse 9 says, this chosen holy nation of royal priests that God treasures, why don't we just go and immediately be with him when we become a part of that all? And that's, I think that's a valid question to ask. I mean, firstly, Christians want to be with God. Sometimes desperately, part of the joy of being a Christian is that we've been um, reunited and we've been uh, made at one with God again when we were separated in the past. And sometimes, for a lot of God's people, like in China or Nigeria or other places around the world, life's really hard for Christians, isn't it? Really difficult and tough. So why doesn't God just take them to be with him rather than let them suffer? But then secondly... As God's people, it doesn't take long to look around the world and through history and Twitter and just see how bad a job Christians have done throughout the years at making God look good. If you've joined us for our Confronting Christianity discussions on a Sunday evenings, we've repeatedly seen the reputation that God has got from the behaviour of people who claim to follow him. And overall, it hasn't been good, whether you think those accusations are fair or not. So why not just take us Christians to heaven the minute we're saved. With the Bible still there, people can still hear about God. Maybe you've thought that if you've ever really failed badly, if you've ever let God down big style or hurt his people with your words or your actions, or you've been aware of how bad a witness you've been, you might have wondered that about yourself. Wouldn't it be better if I wasn't here and I was just in heaven with God? If sin is going to constantly dog our lives, isn't it better if we're taken away from this world as soon as possible so that we can't make a mess and bring more damage to God's name and reputation? So how would you answer that question? Why doesn't God immediately take people to heaven when they become Christians? Now there are loads of good answers we could give to that. Feel free to message me some. I'd be really interested to see how you'd answer that. But in the section we're looking at today, I think Peter gives us one answer for exactly that question. And then that answer fuels the direction for the rest of this letter that he writes. See, up to this point, Peter's reminded the Christians he's writing to of what has happened to them, that God's given them a new birth, which has brought with it hope of an eternal, everlasting, never getting worse, glorious future inheritance. He's then encouraged them because of that truth to fight sin and to strive to live lives that look like their God looks, holy. He's reminded them of their need to do that in community earlier on in chapter 2, as they are together being built up into God's temple, all built on the cornerstone, the strong and everlasting foundation of Jesus Christ. And it's into that flow that we've jumped in and then slowed down the last few weeks. Because the last few weeks we've seen in chapter 2 verse 9 that Peter has encouraged his readers with even more rich detail about what their identity together is, that they're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and God's special treasured possession. All of these have this wealth of imagery behind it, and if you haven't, I recommend catching up on the sermons for the last few weeks to see just a little bit of a bigger picture of what they all mean and who we are. 
But straight after that, Peter gives us the reason for all of this. The reason that God has saved us and joined us together as a people. And it's there at the end of verse 9. Have a look at it. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Why? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Peter tells us that our purpose as Christians, as a local church, is to declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his wonderful light. This one is the same one who made us his people when we were just scattered strangers to him and each other. Look at verse 10. He hasn't selected us from one place or nationality. No, we were scattered and strangers and he has united us together and united us to himself. And he did that by showing us mercy. So instead of turning his right anger at our rebellion on us, he turned it on his son instead at the cross. And in doing that, he united us to each other and to him. You see here, Peter is quoting in verse 10, um, Hosea chapter 2 verse 23, where God says of his people that at some point in the future, I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called not my loved one. I will say to those called not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. You see, what Peter's encouraging Christians and us with here is that God planned for us to be a part of his forever people all along. It wasn't that the Jewish nation messed up so much that God had a plan B. No, that promise in Hosea is fulfilled in us. Peter's saying God's plan of salvation was always meant to crescendo in the church, which always included you and me. And it always includes us and continues to include us. And we're not immediately taken up to heaven because we have a purpose. Avenue Church has a purpose. And as we've said, that purpose is that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. We're to declare praises. Declaring praises then is the fuel behind, the reason, the motivation for the whole of the next section of what Peter is going to tell people. We're called to declare praise. But what does it mean that we're called to declare? Well, the word declare here means just tell out, proclaim. We are saved to proclaim truths about God. That doesn't mean we have to be a preacher or an evangelist or an open air speaker or a youth worker or a home group leader or attend women's group or have a YouTube channel or podcast. But it does mean that we are all called and chosen and saved in order to declare truths about God, to make things known about him. And I think that this letter, Peter makes it clear that we do that in two ways. We do that in word and we do that in deed, by what we say and what we do. So thinking about our words, how are we doing at telling people about what we believe? Like now and day to day, I don't mean how well do you think you do in the future where you're called upon in pressure. Now how are you doing now among your colleagues and your friends? Do we know what we believe? Do we know what the gospel is? Again, I'm not asking if we're great at open-air evangelism or if, or if we can explain the complexities of the debate about the eternal functional subordination of the Son or, or if we can go up to someone in the middle of the street and tell them all of the gospel in one go. But I am asking, how do the words and the way that we use them and the way we speak about life and church and Christians and each other, how does that show the goodness of God and the goodness of his chosen, special, treasured people? How does the way we talk and the jokes we make and the things we joke about and the things we show to other people through what we say. How does that demonstrate what it means to be people from a different nation and a different world? Or are we more well known as Christians as people who are always putting out errors and sins and flaws and imperfections and mistakes in others and the world around us more than we are to pointing out the goodness and praise of God and his people? That isn't what we're safe for. Yes, we're told to point out sin. It would be unloving to point out sin when we see it. But we're mainly called to declare praises. We're going to see a bit more about that in a minute. But our job, our purpose as a local church and as individual Christians is to declare good and brilliant things about the one who saved us. We're called to declare praises about him in our words, but also in our deeds. Like We declare praises to him by what we do. 
So that's what Peter moves on to from verse 11 onwards. Our deeds, the things that we do, in fact, everything we do, well, it's declaring something about what we believe about God. The way we live, the way we behave, the way we act and react in the different circumstances of life, they're all declaring a little bit about what we believe about God. So Peter calls us, people of this new, holy, different, special nation, to live like we're people from a new, holy, different, special nation. We are not to live like everyone else around us who worship anything and everything else and who do whatever they want to do, really. In truth, they haven't got much of a reason to do anything else, but we do. We do because we're different to them, because we're not like them, because we're a separate, chosen, priestly, holy nation and we're God's possession. So we are to live differently. We're to live differently. I don't know if you've seen the TV show An Idiot Abroad. In it, it documents the travels of this man from Manchester called Carl Pilkington, and it follows him as he travels to all sorts of different places around the world. The one I remember the most is probably uh, the first one, where he travels to China, and he's shocked. Like, he's com- his mind can't handle how different China is to where he's used to. Like The toilets, the toilet cubicles, the toilet roll, for example, he just can't get his head around. He struggles with the food they eat a lot, The snacks in particular, if you've seen it, you'll know the thing I'm thinking about. But the hobbies and the pastimes just all seem completely strange and alien to him. But of course they do. He isn't Chinese. He's not from China. He's from a different place. He's got a different way of living. He's not one of them. He's a foreigner. And the same is true of us. We're different. We are Foreigners and exiles, Peter tells us, we're not meant to be like everyone else. We are meant to be different. And so that means we're to fight sinful desires when they come up, meaning we're to resist those desires when they raise their heads. So when we feel the angry reaction or the crude jokes, fight them. When we're tempted to open private browsing late at night, fight it. When we're tempted to have just one more drink, fight it. When we're tempted to flirt with that person we really know we shouldn't, fight it. When we're tempted to lie or cheat or to give in to bitterness or to deceive or slag someone off or do anything that doesn't honour God's rule over us as Lord and King as people from his new nation, we're to fight it. Why? Well, again, there are loads of reasons we could go into, but Peter wants us to remind, wants to remind us, sorry, that those desires do not want our good. These desires, he says, wage war against us. They're not wanting our delight. They want our destruction. They are the remnants of a world that we've been saved from, this darkness. And they're to be fought at all costs. I've quoted this before from the Puritan preacher John Owen, but it's so true. He says, be killing sin or it will be killing you. Sin is not something harmless we can indulge. It's waging war against us and it will kill us if it can. Sin would destroy us if it had the chance. John Owen goes on to encourage people to fight even the smallest sinful thought or desire and to do that by thinking about what that tiny little desire would do, what its end point would be if it could. So think about envy. What would, where, where would envy end if we let it? If we never fought it, if we let it grow and grow and grow, where would its end point be? Well, just ask Cain and Abel. Or what would the end point be of that teeny tiny lustful thought? Well, just ask King David. Or where would putting money and comfort ahead of Jesus and his calling on our lives lead us if it could? Just ask Judas Iscariot. See, sin wages war against us, so we must fight back. But we must fight back being aware, verse 12, that fighting sin in a world that loves it means that we're not going to be liked. The people around us are going to see our good, godly, God-honouring deeds and they're going to accuse us of all sorts of wrongs. They'll call us mad, insane, misogynists, homophobes, bigots, prudes, racists, oppressive. And let's be honest, sometimes those accusations have been accurate of many of people who claim to be Christians throughout history, maybe of some of us in our past. But that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about us as a local church who are living for God wholeheartedly and valuing that more than anything else and living for other people as a first priority. We're still going to get mocked. We're still going to get ridiculed and derided for it because what we believe makes no sense. We may even be isolated and shunned. 
But there's hope in this verse, even when that happens. Have a look at verse 12. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Our faithfulness to fight sin in how we live our lives among the world around us is a powerful witness to the truth of the gospel. How we live and love and operate and fight sin together as a local church is the best gospel witness we have. I've said this before. If you want the world around us to know and see and love Jesus, get stuck into your local church and show how important and wonderful it is, however you can, at the cost of other things that might well be good. You want your non-Christian colleagues, neighbours, friends, family to know that you really do love God and he's worth it, then be committed to your local church. Do you want our children and our young people to grow up loving Jesus and prioritising him in their life to the point they'd be willing to die for him if they were called to do so? Then we need to set the example now when we're not called to do so and we're to prioritize the church Jesus died for the people that we're saved to and with and the purpose that we are saved for we need to act like we really believe what the bible says about church and other Christians we need to act like we really believe it's true otherwise people aren't going to believe what we say we're called to fight sin and doing that in our lives will be a witness in truth, I don't really understand what the end of verse 12 means, that on the day God visits us, there's not a lot of clarity about that. It seems it can either mean the day that God visits individuals and uses our witness to help call them to himself, or it might be talking about one day in the future when Jesus returns to earth to claim his people back for himself, that the world around that mocked and ridiculed us will praise God for our faithfulness in the face of their own ridicule. Truth is, I think both of those are true in the Bible. But either way, we are called to declare about God in our word and deed in the world we find ourselves as Christians. How are we declaring God to the world around us? Where are we fighting sin? Are we fighting sin? Or are we like those back in chapter 1 verse 13 who give in to whatever desire they have at the moment? If we are part of this chosen, royal, priestly, holy, treasured nation of people, then we will all want to fight sin together as part of the way we declare him to the world around us. So we're called to declare, but we're called to declare praises. So our good words and our good deeds have a purpose. And they're not to make us look good. They're not to make our churches look good. They're to make him look good. They're to praise him. Our purpose in being left on this earth when we're saved is to declare his praises. Our job is to see and say and do things that bring praise to his name. And who are we to declare praises to? Well, I think there's two groups of people. Firstly, the pagans around. As we've seen, part of our declaring his praise and is in how that we live. Peter's going to flesh that out in the future verses of this book to show that that includes how we submit to authority, whether in general or at work, how we function as men and women in marriage, even if we're married to people who aren't Christians, and in how we love one another as a church, and endure when the world around makes it hard to keep following Jesus. All of doing that is declaring the praiseworthiness of a God that a world around doesn't believe to the world. So when it's hard to obey earthly authorities and laws, when it is painful to do our jobs that we might not enjoy to the best of our abilities without grumbling, when it's costly to be a good husband or wife, and when it is frustrating and draining and time-consuming to love and forgive each other in a committed community as a local church, but we still do that anyway, that declares to the world around that God, who calls us to do these things, is praiseworthy to us. More praiseworthy than any of that stuff that we're being called to give up. More praiseworthy and worth any of our comfort. When we live differently, it brings praise to him. When we demonstrate how praiseworthy he is to a world around us by how we live, that's brilliant. But secondly, we're called to declare his praises to and with each other. We're to do all of the things that the letter of 1 Peter calls us to do in a community with each other. Notice in verse 11, he doesn't say, Dear friend, I urge you as a foreigner and an exile. No, he says, Dear friends as foreigners and exiles together, united as a local church. Part of our job as a church is to declare the praises of God with and to each other. So when we're struggling, 
we need the church to point us to heaven. When we've failed and we've messed up and we've sinned, however severely, we need the church to point us to the cross. And when we're getting too complacent and proud, we need the church to point us to the reality of who we are and what God's done for us. And we make a much bigger noise declaring praise together than we do apart. Now, you might not think you need to be an active, committed part of Avenue Church all the time. You can take it or leave it. But the Bible says you do. You might have a fantastic personal walk with God. But if you're doing that separate from being committed to others in your local church community, then you're like the best footballer in the world who just won't play with the rest of the team. Or you're like the strongest ant in the farm, but carrying a smaller leaf on your own. Alone, you will never work as well as you could with the others. See, a lone wolf Christian, one who's distant and indifferent from a local church, isn't biblical and is missing out on the encouragement and blessing and confidence that comes from being part of the community that God's established. The community that's designed to declare God's praises with you and to you. And they also miss out on the joy and blessing of being somebody who encourages and declares God's praises to others who really need to hear it. We have no idea how vital our being part of an active local church has been to other Christians or to ourselves. But God does. And that's why he stresses again and again through his word how important it is to be committed to and with God's people in a local church family. We are called as a local church and as individual Christians to declare God's praises in what we say and what we do to the world around us and to each other. And we do that by fighting sin and sticking to the guns of what we believe, even when we get flack and are countercultural and are maligned for doing it. And declaring his praises is the way other people will come to taste and see that God is good. And the way that we keep each other doing all of these things. We need each other as foreigners and exiles to be able to abstain from sinful desires. Because they're, warring, they're waging war against our souls. And we need each other to encourage each other to live such good lives among the pagans that though they might accuse us of doing a wrong, they might see our good deeds and glorify God, who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. But I just want to finish with one last observation on these verses. And I think the observation is probably best illustrated by uh, talking about a radio show podcast that I listen to called Fighting Talk. It's a BBC radio sports panel show quiz thing and it involves four people answering a range of different questions about sport and getting different amount of points for their answers depending on how entertaining the host of the show finds them. It's good fun, I recommend it. But in the final of each of the shows, the top two contestants each get 20 seconds to defend a statement they would never in a million years believe. So uh, they've had Liverpool fans defending the statement, Jurgen Klopp has lost it and needs to be sacked immediately and replaced with Sam Allardyce. Or there have been Wales fans that have been made to defend the statement, Wales shouldn't even have a rugby team and instead all Welsh players should be allowed to play for only England. But the contestants do a really good job of declaring something they just don't believe to be true. Well, most of the time some of them refuse. And the challenge of these verses is whether or not we're trying to be Christians who are like those contestants in the final round of that podcast. Oh, we're trying to obey this calling to declare his praises but in truth, we don't believe them to be true. I'm not saying we might not be Christians, although that's worth thinking. But I expect that most people watching this are those who know what it means to be called by God out of darkness and into his wonderful life. What I'm wondering is, have we lost something of the praiseworthiness of that? Have our hearts got cold towards God? And I'm wondering if perhaps sometimes part of the reason some of our attempts at declaring the praises of God to a world around us and each other aren't as successful as we want them to be. Or if part of the reason we find fighting sinful desires so difficult. Or if part of the reason we find it so challenging to live such good lives among the world around us. It's because we don't really believe that God is worthy of all of our praise. Because we might be trying to do these things from a sense of duty and not a sense of delight. Oh, we know we should do all these things, so we do them, but we don't really believe it's worth it. We don't really feel wholeheartedly like we're doing it for God. We're doing them because they're the right things to do, and that is a good thing, but our hearts might be cold 
and fueled more by obedience than by praise. This is definitely something that I feel often in myself. My eyes get taken off Jesus and how magnificent and beautiful and wonderful and incredible he is and how amazing it is that he should ever set his love upon me and how ridiculous it is that I could be included in this people that Peter is describing. And I focus on other things and my motivation for declaring his praises becomes less real to me. And I know I'm not the only one for whom this happens. So how is your love for Jesus? How is your personal walk with him? How is your personal time with him? Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying to him? Do you have a relationship with him? Do you cherish him? Is he worth everything to you? Is he worth giving up everything for? Is he worth enduring any pain and hardship for? Do you know what it means to echo the words of Job who says, Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. In Philippians 3 verse 8, the Apostle Paul says, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. That is fuel for living a life that declares God's praises, that fights sinful desires and lives good lives in the world. You see, the truth is we will not present a glorious God unless we find him glorious ourselves. We won't present a praiseworthy saviour if we don't find him praiseworthy for ourselves. Oh, we might have all the best apologetic answers for why Christianity is true and good. We might find confronting Christianity a bit beneath us, actually. But we must also demonstrate and prove and believe that Jesus is worth giving up everything to follow and to obey that Jesus quenches the deepest soul thirst of all humans, including ourselves, and that he is ultimately what all people long for in our own lives. How is your love for Jesus? How is your praise of him? How is your heart towards him? What could you be doing to improve that? Who could you be asking to help you along this road to love Jesus more, to love him better? The best, the only real fuel for declaring God's praises is to grow in our personal praise of him and in our corporate praise of him together. Yeah, we really miss hearing each other sing, but that is not the only way we can declare praises. We can read the Bible together. We can read books together. We can pray together. We can discuss them. We can even do it outside of Sundays and home groups. Let's together in the lockdown month ahead, especially perhaps, focus together on Jesus and his praiseworthiness and let's grow our stockpile of fuel to live lives that declare those praises to a world around that so desperately needs to hear and see them. I'll close with the words from a very old hymn by a man called William Cooper, Cowper, I never know how to pronounce it, but I often pray this, Lord, it is my chief complaint that my love is weak and faint. Do you ever feel that? But he carries on, yet yeah, I do love you and adore. Oh, for grace to love you more. Let's by God's grace together and on our own grow in our love and adoration and praise of a God who's called us out of darkness into his wonderful light, who made us who are not a people into a people, who showed us mercy so that that will fuel us to obey these commands in verse 11 and 12. Dear friends, I urge you, as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that, though they might accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. <laughs>